following the webinar today. Um, there will be time for questions and discussions. You can ask a question at any time by typing your question into the chat box on your screen. And um, please take time to fill out the evaluation that will pop up as soon as the webinar ends. Well, today I'm delighted to uh, introduce our topic. It's Women in Poverty in Vermont, Intersections of Inequity and Lessons Learned. We have four wonderful speakers here today. Uh, Carrie Brown is the Executive Director for, uh, from the Vermont Commission on Women. Alban Watersong is the Economic Justice Specialist for the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Pam Green is the Director of Justice and Mentoring Programs for Mercy Connections. And Rachel Jolly uh, is Director of Women's Programs for Vermont Works for Women. Thank you all so much for coming. And let's go ahead for the presentation. Thank you, Paul. This is Carrie. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm really excited to, at the idea that so many people are taking time out of their, their lunch and their day to, to talk about this really important topic. Um, and I'm really appreciative to Pam and Auburn and Rachel for joining us here today. So I'm just going to give a, a little bit of an overview. Um, about women in poverty in Vermont and nationally. And then our other speakers are going to give you a little bit more um, sort of up close view of how things are actually working for women in Vermont uh, based on the work that they are doing and uh, what they see in their work. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of just a little bit of a snapshot of what it looks like for women in poverty. I'll talk a little bit about why poverty disproportionately impacts women and also about what's the broader effect on all of the rest of society when we have more women living in poverty than we do men. Okay. All right, hang on a second. There we go. All right, so what we see in Vermont is that 14% of Vermont women are living in poverty, which is compared to 12% of Vermont men. So we see that there are, there are more, more women who are living in poverty than there are men. 41.8% um, of the female-headed families in Vermont live in poverty. That's you know, close to half, and um, that's higher than the national average. And um, I, I wanted to also point out that in Vermont, if you look at it, we have a rate of 14% of women living in poverty, but if you break it down by race a little bit, it looks a little bit different. So African-American women in Vermont, their poverty rate is 21% which is a little bit better in the U.S., where it's 25%. Hispanic women in Vermont are living in poverty at a rate of 30%, which is compared to 23% in the U.S., so, so that's pretty significant. So that's, a, that, that's a, a really tremendous difference that you see when you start breaking it down by race. And then when we look at age, we see that elderly women, women who are 65 and over, are almost twice as likely to live in poverty as are men. It's about 11.6% of women over 65 who are in poverty compared to 6.8% of men. And that has a lot of implications on their security later on in life. And then 3 in 10 women, that says in Vermont, but it's actually nationally, who work full time don't make enough money to be financially secure. So we, ha we see people who are working and working full time, they they're fully employed and yet they still are experiencing financial insecurity. So this is a little bit more of a breakdown of what you actually need to be able to be financially secure in Vermont. And this is a table that comes from Wider Opportunities for Women's Best Tables, which are, what does that stand for? Basic. Basic economic security. Yeah. Table index. Yeah. Best is the acronym. <laughs> <laughs> and and so um, this, this shows what... If you've got a, a single parent who has two school-aged children, this is their estimation of what that person actually needs to be able to make. And you'll see the first column is if they have a job with benefits, and the second column is a job without benefits. So you can see that they're, they're saying that if you, if you have benefits, you need to be making almost $30 an hour to be able to support that family. And, and this is, some of you might be familiar with the livable wage calculations, and this is a little bit different from that. This is, this is higher. And it, it, I'm not sure exactly the reasons why this is higher, exactly what else has gone into that, but, um, but I, can, I can tell you that if you look closely at this, just when I started scanning it, I started to have some, um, some things pop up, like $136 for utilities sounds 
doesn't sound like a realistic amount to me in a lot of Vermont. I don't know about where people live in the rest of the state, but yeah. So there, so there's a, you know, you can take issue with any of these, um, but our, our cost of living in, in Vermont is pretty high compared to a lot of places, and this just is a good illustration of what that actually means. And so this helps us understand why there's going to be people who are working full time and they're still not financially secure. So why is it that poverty does disproportionately affect women? Well, of course, there are a lot of reasons. And I'll just kind of really quickly go through some of them. One is minimum wage. 62% of minimum wage jobs are held by women. So that's just a disproportionate number of people working at these the lowest paying jobs are women. Uh, another one is part-time work. Women are much like, more likely to work part-time than men are. 27% uh, of women who are working working part-time, uh, which is compared to 11% of men who are working. And single heads of households is another one. Women are more likely to be single heads of households than men. They're more likely to be single parents, which means that they're bearing the responsibility of raising children with fewer economic resources. Nationally, there are about 14 million female heads of households compared to 5 million male heads of households. And the wage gap is another one. This is a sort of everything else kind of ties into this, but we know that overall women don't make as much money as men do. Nationally, women are making about 77% of what men do. In Vermont, it's about 86%. And again, there's lots of reasons for this. One of them is kind of related back to the minimum wage um, piece, which is that there's some a dynamic called occupational segregation where men and women will cluster in certain occupations. And the ones that are predominantly male tend to pay more than the ones that are predominantly female. And, and so we see that in the minimum wage jobs. We see lots of service jobs that women are holding. Uh, in a little story I like to tell is back in 1964, which is when the Vermont Commission on Women was started, the most common job for women at the time was secretary. And the most common occupation for women now is, they changed how they describe it, they call it secretary slash administrative assistant. So we <laughs> we're still really clustering in, in uh, the lower paying jobs. And then another one is family responsibilities. Women bear a much greater burden of family caregiving than men do. 74% of employed mothers report staying home from work when their child is sick, and that's compared to 40% of employed fathers. And 80% of mothers are the ones who assume primary responsibility for taking their children to the doctor. Um, almost half of all women report they've lost pay or promotions or struggle to keep their jobs because they need to care for sick children. But only about a third of men, actually less than a third of men, have reported the same thing. And women are more than two-thirds of the adults who are providing substantial assistance to aging parents, which is just becoming a growing problem in Vermont. And lastly, what, what does this mean to everybody else? What does it mean to the rest of all of us in our society when there's so many women who are living in poverty? Well, one big thing is because women are, are so often heads of households and so often caring for children is that children are living in poverty. Nationally, it's almost 20% of children live in poverty, and it's 15.3% in Vermont, which is higher than the poverty rate in general in Vermont. You're more likely to be poor if you're a child. And we know that uh, if $3,000 per year lower family income in early childhood is associated with 17% lower productivity in adulthood. So there's a direct connection between what happens for all the rest of us in society when children grow up in um, much lower income homes. Poverty can really have cascading effects on children. It can constrain their access to high quality child care, to books, educational related resources, which can compromise cognitive development. And children in poverty are much more likely to experience excessive adversity or what they call toxic stress, which is as opposed to the regular kinds of stress that all of us experience sometimes, the toxic stress which is ongoing and can really disrupt the development of brain architecture in early childhood. Also, living below the poverty line is one of the most reliable predictors of depression and other mental health disorders and as physical health as well. So women who are in poverty and have breast cancer are 11% more, more likely to die. And it, women who live in poverty and have heart disease are more likely to die. Low-income pregnant women receive less prenatal care and are more likely to have premature babies. 
And then finally, insecurity and retirement, which is tied to the higher level of women in poverty who are over 65. Women have less money in retirement benefits. They have less in Social Security benefits, often because they've worked less or they've worked at lower paying jobs. They have less in personal savings because they haven't made as much money over the course of their lifetime. And when a woman loses a spouse to divorce or death, it has a much more detrimental effect on women than it does on men, leaving them more likely to be insecure later on. So I'm going to turn it over now to Auburn. And are you going to do that? OK, great. And Auburn will talk a little bit about her work and her perspective. OK, thanks, Carrie. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK, great. So um, in order to make the connection between women in poverty and domestic violence, we first need to acknowledge that domestic violence is a gendered phenomenon. Um, to begin with, we know the definition of domestic violence is that it's a pattern of abusive behavior used by one person to gain, t maintain power and control over their partner. Um, we also know research tells us that women are 90 to 95 percent more likely to suffer domestic violence than men. And one in four women will be a victim of domestic violence in her lifetime. And in some cases, some statistics say as uh, many as one in three women. Uh, <clears throat> another study has shown us that 85 percent of the victims um, were female with male partners, um, with 15 percent um, being uh, same-sex relationships or men who were battered by a female partner. So that's one place to start um, understanding domestic violence as gendered. Um, when we start talking about poverty and violence against women, uh, what's really important to acknowledge is that poverty itself is not a predictor of sexual or domestic violence, but it does increase both the risk factors that contribute to violence, and it reduces a victim's ability to flee, to find safety and security. Um, when sexual or domestic violence occur within the context of economic insecurity, getting help and moving forward with life often competes with just the very real basic life needs, um, like putting gas in the car or paying bills or keeping a roof overhead. Uh, personal safety and economic security are linked for victims of domestic violence. Um, for many of them, concerns over their ability to provide for themselves and their children are actually one of the most primary reasons for staying in or returning to an abusive relationship. So access to services and resources that increase economic stability are really essential in helping a victim rebuild a life after abuse. So let's talk about women in poverty and risk. What um, research is telling us now that um, the economic background of a woman um, does have some connection to the amount of risk that she's at in. So a woman from a social, socioeconomically disadvantaged background is actually twice as likely to experience domestic violence than someone from a more um, advantaged background. Um, and the, the woman from the disadvantaged background is actually more likely to be repeatedly abused or to experience severe violence than women in more advantaged backgrounds. Uh, with regard to income, we know that women with household incomes of less than 7,500, and that's deep poverty, are seven times as likely as women with household incomes over 75,000 dollars a year to experience domestic violence. Uh, we know that um, there's a relationship to housing, um, and this bears out in Vermont. The majority of women who experience domestic violence are in rental housing. Um, it, nationally, it's three times the rate of women who own their own homes. And in our experiences with our member programs here in Vermont, we find that probably around 90% of the victims we're working with are in fact uh, renting rather than owning their homes. Um, also what plays into some of the risk is the status. Now research is telling us that single women with children are most at risk. They're actually 13 times more likely to experience domestic violence than married women with children, 17 more, 17, excuse me, seven times more likely than single women 
without children. And then also young women between the ages of 16 and 24, they experience the highest rate of domestic violence and sexual assault. So we're really looking at um, high risk for single women with children and younger women. Now, um, again, I've talked about the disadvantaged neighborhood, and I just wanted to emphasize that um, what goes along with the disadvantaged neighborhood are the unmet needs for services and support. So it's almost a vicious cycle where there's unmet need, and that can create risk. And then at the other end, when she tries to flee and, and obtain safety and security, um, she finds that there are less options, fewer options, and then there's more um, reason to stay um, in an abusive relationship when there are those unmet needs. Uh, domestic violence and homelessness, I, I, I've shared this statistic with a lot of people and they, they're very surprised by it, but nationally domestic violence is the third lead, leading cause of homelessness. Um, and I think that shocks a lot of people. I, I find um, another stat um, very interesting, 92% of homeless mothers uh, report physical or sexual abuse during their lifetimes. And if we're thinking about the effect of trauma long term, on a woman who's a victim, uh, and then we can make those connections. We realize that homeless mothers, 92% um, of them are reporting that they have had some trauma uh, related to domestic of Our services related to homelessness and housing are trauma-informed services. And of course, employment loss and education loss increase risk. Um, again, it's, it's the fewer options um, for safety and security for a victim. So this leads us to the um, next question, which is um, often asked um, too much, really, about why does she stay? And the reason why I put that up there is not because I encourage that we ask that question, but because that question in itself reveals a lot about economics when we're talking about victims. First of all, um, one of the reasons, and I always have to say this regardless of economics, the danger of violence, including the risk of death, escalates when a domestic violence survivor attempts to leave a batterer. So that right there is just a, kind of answers that question without, re, without regard for ec to economics. But, um, moving on into the economics of it, three quarters of women in abusive relationships reported staying with their abusers longer for financial reasons. So 75% of women um, who have been abused report that financial reasons were the reasons that they stayed. And, um, and I know that some of you may have heard recently about the, the Ray Rice um, scandal in the NFL, and there was a hashtag that was created called Why I Stayed. And really, if you were ever, if you're a Twitter person and you ever go to on the Twitter feed and look at why I stayed, um, that really bears out that so many uh, people who victims who responded to that hashtag said that financial reasons were um, the cause of why they could not get out. They did not feel they could be um, stable enough financially to uh, be safe and secure, and they were making choices between violence and um, homelessness, um, and that's really no choice at all. So um, that said, uh, one of the reasons they stay is the lack of safe and affordable housing. And we know that this is a challenge in Vermont as well as across the country. Vermont, the rental vacancy in Burlington right now is about 1%, about 2% in Bennington. And we hear that a healthy uh, rental vacancy is about 5%. So. We do have um, reason um, to look at this in Vermont and look at what is uh, safe and affordable housing for victims in order for them to um, get out of abusive relationships. And, and some of this has already been framed by Carrie, who spoke a little bit ago about what is a livable wage and, um, and how difficult it is for women to um, actually working full time to feel like they have that kind of security and have those options right now. So um, we know that um, from the emergency shelters, shel excuse me, emergency solutions grant report that came out that about 49% um, of families last year spent their stay at a domestic or sexual violence shelter, 49% of the emergency solutions grant 
um, participants. So um, we're about a third to a half of um, our homeless population in Vermont right now, depending on what data you look at, are homeless um, because of domestic violence. So we do have a real um, need for concern about finding safe and affordable housing for victims in Vermont. Um, we in, at the Vermont Network Programs have seen in the past five years an increase of about 50 percent, 49 percent in the number of shelter nights uh, provided to survivors and children. So that's really indicative of longer stays at our shelters due to in, an increase in economic stress and a lack of available safe and affordable housing. So um, I, I would be remiss not to also mention that one of the other reasons that she stays is simply because of the economic abuse that she has suffered. And we don't always think about this when we think about victims um, and the tactics that are used uh, against them um, to coerce them and control them. But um, abusers uh, will do things like damage credit or um, or create a damaged banking history where they run up fees for bounced checks and haven't paid them back. They'll put things in there in the victim's name. The victim may have no access to cash or be set on allowance. Abusers may prohibit her from working. And um, oftentimes, abusers isolate victims from the resources of family and friends. Another um, reason that she says that's related to economics is that um, if she is employed, um, there are often, especially in some of these minimum wage jobs, there are often um, a lack of paid safe uh, days or sick days, if you will, for a victim to safely access supports and remedies. Uh, those are really critical. And oftentimes, the abuser helps to um, create fear of public supports. And again, that's more of the isolation so that the victim feels uh, worried, concerned, or frightened by um, any um, seeking any services from DCF or, or even connecting with health insurance or child care reimbursement programs. So what can we do? This is my conclusion. Um, of course, increasing the minimum, minimum wage is, is critical. Um, we also need to create access to asset building opportunities. And I think that Pam and Rachel will be talking about this some more, too, because when I talk about asset building, I'm not just talking about things like match savings programs or, or loan, uh, microloan programs. I'm also talking about building personal assets like job readiness and um, job skills. And that will be coming up more in a little bit, I'm sure. Um, of course, I talked about safe and affordable housing being critical and that we need to um, continue to strengthen access to quality and affordable child care, which enables a victim to um, have the time to seek the services she needs to seek. There's so many legislative and policy changes that need to shift in order to help lift women out of poverty, which will also just, again, um, enable a victim to um, be able to find safety and security. So the paid sick days legislation that currently is going through our Vermont legislature. Uh, the Affordable Care Act nationally has done great things for victims. We need to continue to look at increasing reach-up grants and working on food security for victims. Um, we need to improve access to attorneys and court advocates and strength and direct services. This is really critical in Vermont because in Vermont over the last five years, the Legal Assistance for Victims Program, which is a federal program, federally funded program, and the Transitional Housing Program, also federally funded, have been deeply cut. Um, we have seen um, an increase at the same time in the um, amount of hotline calls over the last five years, an increase of 128%. We have an increase of 29% um, in the number of domestic violence victims that we have served over the last five years, all while losing grant money and over the last five years actually um, across the entire state, our member programs, of which there are 13, we've lost a collective 23 full-time positions. So the supports and services that victims need when they decide to seek safety or support um, are continuing to be cut. So there's a real imbalance there that, that we need to work on. And um, so 
I'm open to hearing any um, questions or or comments that you have on this, and I invite you to join me in um, trying to do some of these things. So, okay, I am done with my section, and I, I guess I'm passing it on now to, I'm not sure if I'm passing it on to, I think I'm passing it on to Pam, right? Yeah. Thank you, Auburn. Okay, thank you. Well, I think after hearing our last two speakers, uh, a, a saying comes to mind, which is, if you're not outraged, you're really not paying attention. But I want to start by just thanking everybody for being a part of this webinar, and thank you to Paul, his staff, and office for leadership to, to have a series on such an important topic as women and poverty in Vermont. Um, poverty is definitely a woman's issue. I think we've well established that. You know that. I'm not going to belabor it um, more at this point. But I have to share with you that really, as I sit here today, I have more questions than answers about ways to significantly change what I refer to as the misery index of poverty. And just a couple of my questions. You know, why is violence so pervasive in intimate relationships? Why is there so much childhood sex abuse in Vermont? Why are there so, is there so much untreated trauma? And why do we have such high rate of addiction? You know, as a native Vermonter, I have worked on issues of poverty all of my adult life, learned a lot, done a lot, but need to learn and do a lot more. Fifty years ago, Lyndon Baines Johnson was president and declared a war on poverty in his State of the Union address. This was a noble effort. And it has left a lasting legacy of wonderful programs, like Head Start as one example. But the war on poverty, as we know, was never won. Uh, it's my belief that it's because the political wind shifted and the political will to win the war on poverty was lost. So today the face of poverty, as I see it and in Vermont, is complex. It seems to be a very complicated combination of individual factors, and certainly public policy, and that's at the state, local, and federal level. Each person I've learned in poverty and each family is a true individual and has a unique set of circumstances. And yet we as providers and systems, really it's hard and difficult for us to deal with these individual solutions. And therefore, many people do fall between the cracks. A couple of greatest changes I want to share with you that I've found in, let's just call it the last 20 years of poverty, anti-poverty work. And it's the influence of three things. Severe trauma, which is untreated, addictions, and mental health issues. And obviously there's an interplay among those three. Um, we've talked a lot about the barriers to climbing out of poverty, but you know I have to be somewhat redundant to share the outrageous housing costs in Vermont, it's really at an unacceptable level. Um, six years of the Great Recession, what that's done, to everything from jobs and wages. And for women, I mean, it's, it's just almost tiresome to repeat it. And we've been repeating it for about 40 years. But it's the lack of safe and affordable child care, paid sick leave, livable wage, training, education, flexible work schedules. And the list goes on. Well, let me try quickly to shift to some good news. I work at Mercy Connections. And on your screen, you can see um, some of our clients, our constituents. Uh, they're in three areas. Let me just quickly touch on education, mentoring, entrepreneurship, and community building. And within this work, we have found that there are five ways to success. These are small, individual steps and I'd like to share them with you. One, having an individual mentor. This happens to be a program that I am currently working in, the Vermont Women's Mentoring Program for Women Returning from Jail to Chittenden County. And we partner with Vermont Works for Women and the Vermont DOC to provide this program. We've been doing that since 2003. And the results are wonderful. The last two years, we've had zero uh, recidivism rates for the women in our program. Number two, 
COSA, Circles of Support and Accountability. Now, this is not a program that we run, but it's a favorite of mine. You may have heard of it. It's a correctional model out of Canada, and it involves it, uh, a very serious sex offenders, violent offenders, agreeing to have three to five people who are their support and accountability group that meet with them weekly and hold them both accountable and provide support in specific areas of need. And I really feel that this would work within anti-poverty circles as well. Thirdly, peer-led monthly support groups that are professionally facilitated for people after they go through individual or programs, they need some place to come at least monthly to keep them on the path towards success. Uh, fourth is the innovative programs, and I'll just list one name that we happen to run, Getting Ahead in a Just Getting By World. Do um, check it out online. It's an, from the AHA process. Uh, it's not one of our homegrown programs, but women in deep poverty and with mental health issues are really finding improvements in their life through taking this um, very important program. The fifth and final that I'll just mention is our entrepreneurial training program. Women do find self-employment as a way, a path to slowly lift themselves and their families out of poverty. So in closing, I'd just like to say keep up the good work out there. Don't forget to vote your values next Tuesday, November 4th. Thank you, Pam. So now we'll turn things over to Rachel Jolly from Vermont Works for Women. Thank you. So I'm going to, I think, touch on a number of issues that both Carrie Auburn and Pam have talked about. Um, and obviously there are some recurring themes. Vermont Works for Women um, addresses the issue of poverty through working towards economic independence for the women we work with. So we were founded 27 years ago by a carpenter who wanted more, she knew that it was a very level wage career. She wanted more company out on the work sites. And she started a program called Step Up for Women um, that was specifically for women who are interested in the skilled trades. So the skilled trades were mentioned in our in our original mission and she was working she wanted women toward, to work toward the level wage. Over the twenty seven years our programs have morphed, we've expanded, um, we now work with girls as well. And we don't just work at, at a livable wage level when starting out. As you'll see when I talk about some of our programs for women in transition, sometimes we're working at, you know, we're helping women in minimum wage jobs, but the idea is that it's a stepping stone towards um, financial independence. So this is our mission as it currently stands. And we, like I mentioned, we do have girls programs. We work with middle and high school girls. Hopefully starting, in, these conversations obviously need to start from very young ages when working with our children, girls and boys, about, about life choices, class choices in school, and how they might work towards independence in a variety of ways, economic being one of them. And we heard again and again in those early days of our, our founding from women in our programs, I wish we had started, I had something like this earlier, I wish you know, I had taken diff different classes. So we do have a strand of girls programs, but today I'm going to focus on our women's programs. And Underneath the branch of women's programs, we have two main threads. One is the non-traditional employment training programs, which I, I just referred to. Clearly, those still the non-traditional. Carrie was mentioning um, gender segregation in the workforce, and it's absolutely still a focus to steer women towards at least open their eyes to many different opportunities. A lot of em employment sectors that have been dominated by men that do pay livable wages to start with, and then very lucrative wages. Um, even a few years in, and so we definitely believe that the, it's still important to introduce opportunities for women to learn about those careers, to get the training that they might need, or even the pre-training before, say, a police academy or before an apprenticeship of a skilled trade, so that they have the confidence and they're learning some of the hidden social norms of those careers that, because they have been dominated by men, can feel even more intimidating for a woman entering them. I won't go too much into the, the specifics of those programs, but um, I will talk today about our training for women in transition. So we have a variety of programs for women, and um, we say a lot. Of, you can describe a lot of women as being in transition if they're moving from high school to to post high school, if they're moving from 
um, married life to divorce, from um, working life to retirement. Obviously, there's a lot of transitions in our life. We're talking here about women who have several employment barriers. So I'm starting here with talking about the women that we work with at the Chittenden County, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. So they're in prison currently and um, needing some opportunities to help them build their skills post-incarceration, as well as what is they're currently incarcerated. Some have, do have long sentences, and we want to work to build up their skills um, so that they can feel like they're growing in their potential while incarcerated. So a variety of classes, mostly centered around employment skills, work readiness classes that happen once a week to work on the soft skills. We're actually seeing it because um, I don't for some of you who might not be familiar with incarcerated women's issues in Vermont, um, over the last 10 years, they ha the incarcerated women have moved facilities four times. And the most recent facility they're in, Chittenden Regional, was not built to be a long-term um, prison. It was built to be a detention facility. So there's not many opportunities um, for programming or for vocational training. So we, we started a program there when they moved in 2011 to act as a little bit of a human resources hub for any kind of inmate employment. So for the 60 or so jobs that exist, we have um, developed a process to model what goes on in the real world from the application time, filling out an application that mirrors the real life application, screening it as we would, looking for spelling errors, things like that, going through an interview process, a training process for work, and giving, having more accountability not only for the employees but for the supervisors, the CRCF staff who um, might now need to go through a process themselves before somebody is fired. It may be a mediation process or um, you know, there's, there's more procedures and policies that we hope will mirror and give training opportunities for women, um, mirror the real world. We also have exposure events, monthly enrichment nights. Once a month, we bring in a professional from the outside world to talk about her life, her, her career, um, how she got into that career, what she wished she had done differently, what she's glad she did, and to share some, some obstacles that she encountered while getting there. We find that a lot of women um, who in, in poverty often are looking in a, in a small world for the role models of what's possible for them. And so if they have experience in retail, for instance, then they believe that retail is the, the one employment opportunity available. So exposure, we've found, for girls and for women is critically important to, to open their eyes to a wider, wider opportunity. And then uh, more recently, we've started um, doing some risk reduction programming, so as in risk of recidivism, trying to lower the risk for recidivism, which can, can be applied to a number of different factors. We're looking, it's, it's related to cognitive change um, the curricula is based on cognitive change, but we apply it to the work world in terms of examining um, one's thinking for, that might lead to problems either getting employment or re um, retaining employment. Pam mentioned this as well. This is a program that we, that we have run for 13 years in partnership with Mercy Connections. It's offering companionship and support to women currently incarcerated and as they're reentering the community. Our transitional jobs program started in 2008 when we saw a gap for women who were transitioning either off of state benefits or out of incarceration into the workforce. So definitely women were encouraged by either their, maybe their case managers or support people in their life to get that job, but they were finding that their criminal record or other, or a gap in their work history was a major barrier and they, they needed assistance. So we started this program that's running um, now it's five cycles a year. It's a six-week job readiness program. And it focuses on the soft skills, but also has a um, hands-on work opportunity, a stipended work crew experience while they're in the program to be that first step towards either subsidized employment or even permanent unsubsidized employment. We also started in 2011, we started a uh, social enterprise. It, it was the second for Vermont Works for Women, a hybrid between a business and the nonprofit model to meet three, three bottom lines. We want to train women, of course. We want to feed children, which I'll talk about how we do that, and source food locally. So this is a, a program, that's a 13-week culinary training program that um, serves air, about 300 meals a day to area daycare centers and teen centers. Also does some catering on the side, but its primary purpose is to feed hungry children. So it actually addresses poverty in a couple ways. 
and is has been found we're we're at about an 81 percent employment rate with this with this program, and we actually find women getting a lot of gratification from learning how to cook more nutritious meals for their families at home. So in turn, I. I think I'll be repeating some of what has already been mentioned today in terms of what we see when working with women in poverty. And um, one of the, the is top issues that is harder to quantify and, and sometimes address, but low self-esteem can be paramount, is, is paramount, I would say, for the, the majority of women that we work with. And again, it's hard to offer a, a lesson in self-esteem and, and kind of uh, wipe our hands and say we, we've tackled that one. It's, it's a, it can be a lifelong process for any of us um, to improve our self-esteem, to feel grounded in who we are and what we can do. But um, for women who have been told again and again that they have not been worthy or that they have not been successful, this can be a, a barrier that, that is really difficult to overcome but essential if we are to work towards economic independence. Trust issues, again, this is if, if um, abuse has been and chronic trauma has been present in a woman's life, there, um, obviously, it can be lack of trust issues. There can be shame for um, behaviors that a woman has um, been a part of or just her lack of success. Fear of the unknown, which can be related to the lack of trust, but success can be equal, just as scary, if not more so, than um, the status quo of either unemployment or body employment. Fear of rejection or assumption of, re um, of rejection and a lack of practice with commitment and what that might look like. It, again, interrelated with the trust issues, if somebody has not had a lot of committed relationships in their life, commitments that have been honored and kept to, then that idea of, of honoring an employment commitment can also be a new idea and something that needs practice. Um, there could be, as, as Auburn talked quite a bit about, about someone at home holding her back. We see this in a number of ways from, um, from partners controlling cell phone usage to, to in earning income, you know, their, their earned income from work, or just the, the messages that they've been given about what's possible for them or what's not possible. A lack of experience with healthy conflict resolution and uh, lack of role models for, for healthy conflict resolution, which obviously needs to, can play a part in the workplace if that, if that hasn't been practiced. Um, and these last two are, are connected, the self-sabotage that are connected to some of the other things I've mentioned before. If somebody is has fear of the unknown or is, is assuming rejection from the get-go, then self-sabotage we see a lot. If somebody things are really starting to go well, a job has been offered, a job has been taken, and things are going really well for several months, that's when the scary part can really start. That's when um, all of a sudden the expectations are building higher. Maybe they've had, maybe we, um, have profiled this person in the media, that can actually be a negative thing for somebody who's now feeling like they're gonna, they've are gonna they added to the list of who they've let down if things didn't go well. And sometimes they can just end it right there and, and quit or make, make something happen so that the job will end and then at least it will be back to comfort zone area. So with, in terms of what helps, some of the strategies we use in for gender responsive or trauma-informed programming we assume that trauma is present, even if um, physical or emotional abuse hasn't ha ha hasn't been present, which it often has. Um, just the, tr the, par the trauma of poverty, the tax on the brain, the constant living with that high stress that that Paul mentioned in the in the introduction is is definitely um, an issue for for the women that we work with. And so we we don't we don't need to ask questions about that. Though we learn quite a bit in our even in our intake process. We just assume it is from the outset. We also practice doing things with one's body and hands in terms of role playing, new, new skills that we're, we're offering. If we're talking about conflict resolution, we're not just going to teach it in a lecture scenario. We're going to actually play it out. This is especially important if, if um, trauma has happened in, de in the brain development years where actual neuron pathways haven't been formed and you need to set down new brain, brain connections of how something works, practices is essential. The support and constant reminders of using support, the fact that that's not a show of weakness to use your support. Modeling, absolutely. Accountability is critical. Um, understanding without enabling, show, showing that you understand maybe where difficulty is coming from, but still holding firm to some boundaries. And then choices and opportunities for control and steering the process on the part of the participants. I think Auburn 
and also uh, mention some of the reasons this might be so necessary if somebody has had those choices and, and uh, opportunities for control taken away from her and giving those to her even if in, for a, a few hours a day within a program setting or even in a one-on-one -on -one appointment, a case management appointment for an hour can be just the start to a new, a new way of thinking or acting in the world. So that's my conclusion, and I think I know the four of us have touched on some common themes. I wanted to leave you up here with um, our, our Vermont Works Women's contact information, but also I know I'm transferring now to question and answers. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. We do have a bunch of questions. So I'm going to start. This, um, this uh, has to do with the way we provide services. So uh, I'm a frontline staff person at the Human Services Agency, and I work with men and women old and young, anyone who comes in the door looking for crisis help, housing, food, etc. What I, what I do is not specific to women or men, but I work with a lot of single moms. And that's no surprise, as you spoke about. Um, how, how would the panel suggest I think about my work with women differently? Do I even need to think about it differently? One thing, I'll, this is Rachel Jolly, I'll jump in. One thing that we often revisit when we're talking about um, incarceration issues and gender responsive strategies there is the pathways to incarceration, but you could apply that, to, you could think about the pathways to poverty. Um, I, so I think that's one way to differentiate between men and women is just thinking about their path, how they got to where they are, why are they sitting in your office before you, and how is that connected to, to other societal influences, for domestic violence, for instance, or um, or the fact that they're heading a household alone, um, I think that's where gender does play a part. Clearly, in the employment world, where we often are trying to encourage employers to be gender neutral, but that sometimes takes effort because even though an employer might think things are gender neutral in their policies and practices, there actually is, has been um, a paradigm set with who they have in mind um, for a traditional applicant, and maybe that is geared towards men. So in case management, it does seem that considering gender is important, and even though your, your treat, the things that come out of your mouth may not be, um, maybe not be that different, the questions you ask, I guess that's something that comes out of your mouth, the questions you ask um, could be, and the understanding of how that might impact her ability to make progress. Well, this is Pam, and one thought I have, because I've been a state worker and I know how tight your time is, how limited amount of time you have to spend with constituents, is to compile or have a volunteer or intern compile a resource guide, just a simple guide to your uh, county, your community, where the resources are, the church resources, the nonprofits, the United Ways, et cetera. And we've done that at Mercy Connections, and it's very helpful to people. And also something you can, you know, hand them and give them something like a life raft to, to leave your office with. And, and this is Carrie. I'll just add on to that. But at the Vermont Commission on Women, we have a statewide version of that, so that wherever you are in the state, yeah. you can at least get a start on finding the resources that are most local to you. And just going back to Rachel's uh, talk about trauma-informed services, it seems particularly needed for everybody, but also for, for, for women who are coming in looking for services. Yeah, I would say that for us, too, single-sex programming works well with the populations we're working with because so much of the trauma in women's life has been connected to men in their lives. And so having a, a supportive environment with supportive women in, in their world actually sometimes stands out as unique. It's something they're, they are seeking. Sometimes they, they don't, they're not seeking specifically a female-only environment, and actually it might make them nervous because they tell us that, you know, no offense against women, but I don't really like them very much because they've had such negative experiences with fellow other girls or women in their lives, which is something that we're addressing now in programming around peer aggression. However, it's, it's, it can be an empowering event to have, or empowering experience to have a, um, a group of women um, supporting them and cheering them on and, and it, that they, whom they can relate with. And I feel like because it, it is a trauma-informed approach to have a safe environment with other women that's not necessarily going to be re-triggering for them. This question and, um, is about gender segregation in the workforce. Um, aren't women choosing the jobs that they want? 
<laughs> I'll try to answer that. <laughs> um, you know, I think theoretically we're all doing exactly what we want without influences from any undue sources, but I don't think that it really works that way. And and I, I can't tell you what goes into people's decisions behind which job they take, but I, I do think that we can't ignore the fact that when you look at which occupations are the ones that are dominated by men tend to pay more than the ones that are dominated by women. And so if women are choosing to go into lower paying jobs, there's kind of a chicken egg question here. And, and I don't have the answer to that. But I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's not OK just to stop at the point of, well, people choose the, the jobs that they want. We have to be thinking about why is that. And, and, you know, and people do what they see. And uh, I'll, I'll let you talk just a sec, Auburn, sorry. But, um, <laughs> When you look at when you look at people who are working, say, in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, and you see mostly men, then you may or may not think of yourself as doing it. If you're a girl in high school and you look down the hall at your tech center at the auto tech program or the construction technology program and you see it's all boys in there, then you're not necessarily even going to think, oh, I could try that. And if you do think you want to try that, then you're you have to push so far beyond what everyone around you is expecting of you that it can be really hard. And so we, so we can't discount the impact of those expectations and assumptions that everybody else is putting on people as they choose their careers. OK, sorry, Auburn, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, Carrie. I thought you were done there. I just wanted to add that, of course, choice really assumes a safe environment. And um, as we know, you know, so many women um, are experiencing some sort of uh, power or coercion in their lives, some coercive control that um, actually makes their choices very limited. And that, um, in and of itself, um, can often sort of uh, rule what um, their paths um, going forward are. And that relates also to the previous question, which was around you know, how, I should, how I should be looking at the clients that I work with that come in for help. And, and I just I wanted to add to that um, piece as well is not we're not just looking at the pathways to poverty, but we're looking at the pathways out. And and when those are impeded by someone who is controlling and coercing um, and has power over and is creating fear, um, then those options are very limited. And, and um, the first and foremost thing that needs to be addressed is um, the woman's safety before uh, those other um, options are available to her. So this question has to do with TANF. Um, what's the chance that we can increase TANF grants? Why does that not, not seem to gain the same momentum as paid sick days? And I just want to say that um, in addition to that, uh, the majority of uh, adults on TANF, TANF program, as you know, well over 90% are women. And i just also like to add that um, the penetration rate in the TANF is very low nationally, 24%. So why are women not accessing this program? Why are people in poverty not accessing the program? And why not just increase the grants? What, what are some of the things we're facing? What is TANF? I'm sorry. And TANF is the Temporary Aid for Needy Families. It is the Welfare to Work program nationally. And in Vermont, it's called Reach Up. Well, this is Pam. I wish we had more time just on that topic. Maybe at your March uh, conference, you can have a a series on that. It's political. Now, I'm just going to stop there. I mean, it's political. It started at the feds. It trickles down. And like I said in my piece, don't forget to vote your values. I'm not sure I can directly um, answer the question, but I will say that the benefits clip is, could, could have been added to the, the, um, the list of what we see and what women struggle with when trying to climb out of poverty. Actually, it's fresh in my mind because of an example this morning of somebody who went through our transitional jobs program, had really had a long gap in her history, her work history due to substance abuse, um, and went from working zero hours to a full-time job with an organization which, for which she had a, a subsidized position through our transitional jobs program. They liked her so much. Her experience was so positive. They hired her for a full-time job. So now her benefits have been dramatically cut back. Um, her, her rent is higher. Her costs are higher for transportation because of the commute she has to her work. And she just had her car break down. And she's in, that, she's in her first few months of already feeling insecure in a new job and starting to question, maybe I should just go back. 
this, it was easier before. I have to say it was easier. And so um, I know we've been, we've had conversations um, in the legislature last year, and, and one of our employees testified to the, to, to the benefits clip issue, um, expanding reach up benefits or um, increasing them, or, and, and also looking at weaning them down and instead of cutting them off is a huge issue for, for so many who are trying to come out of poverty because it, it often it seems like a disincentive to work. I'll just say that um, I think the question uh, nationally and, and statewide though remains why are only 24% of the people in poverty who are eligible for TINA, mainly women, accessing that program and what barriers are in place for that to happen. So just something to think about. We've got questions. Carrie, this one's directed towards you. It's um, about talking about some of the policies that are needed to address poverty among women. And, and I just want to add, when I was doing some reading, there are so, the state variations are so intense. Like there are some states where women um, are dramatically uh, a higher proportion living in in poverty than other states, and it looked like Vermont was kind of in the middle of the pack there. So what accounts for the state variations, and um, what, what kind of policy solutions are you looking at? Well, a lot of the state variation is due to the poverty level as a whole in those states, where that, so that the level, the, there might be a higher rate of women in poverty, but there's also a higher rate of men in poverty, just overall the incomes are lower there. So that, that is a huge part of it. Uh, and, um, you know, things like child care is a gigantic impact if someone has good quality, dependable child care, if they have transportation so they can get to child care and get to their jobs. These are ways that, that can really contribute to people being able to hold down jobs that can particularly affect women. And um, transportation is one of those that we, we all, I'm sure, see the impact of, of that. So, um, uh, so that's what I would say would be a, a couple of ways to start, and uh, as just as many uh, policies that are going to be supporting the movement out of poverty, rather than the as we were talking about with TANF, being able, kind of being able to move out and recognizing that it's a process and it's a transition. And so, if, if you have that 40-hour a week job, it doesn't mean that you no longer need the support. That you need to be able to actually move through it. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, um, are there any other uh, networks out there for women in poverty? I'm thinking we had somebody present and we actually did a pilot project on the Family Independence Initiative. It wasn't uh, just for women, although mainly women were in it. And these were kind of self-organizing groups uh, that came together to achieve goals. What other networks are out there or can you think of um, that we could support in terms of uh, for low income women particularly? I don't, I, nothing well, is coming well, to mind. <laughs> maybe that's a need. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like something maybe we could we could talk about as we collectively yeah. think about um, uh, the future. And then maybe just briefly, um, and I, I think this is, um, you know, on the, this is evidence to all of us, but some of the challenges in a rural state for women, particularly, I'm thinking um, high quality child care uh, really enhances uh, cognitive development and uh, many lower income people don't have access to that so are doing informal child care which can be good but we know that high quality child care really hits it. So what, what is the, what, what's the issue facing a rural state with transportation child care and, and other things in terms of uh, low income? Are there different challenges in our rural state, I guess, on that? Well, this is Pam. I I'm a big fan of home-based Head Start and home visiting. And that's fallen a lot out of favor politically in Vermont over the years. And I think it's time to bring it back. I, and I, I, Auburn, I don't know if you want to jump in, because I know isolation, can, in both of our world, your world, Auburn, and my world around employment, Isolation can just be a big, aside from childcare and transportation, which I, I would say would be the biggest barriers, um, just the isolation of, of somebody who might be new to the workforce, isolated, if, if domestic violence is a, and sexual violence is an issue, then purposeful isolation in rural, a rural nature can only exacerbate that, um, but also for somebody who might be new to the workforce and just making now, like if she has now has a, a job commitment, even if it's part-time or, or full-time, um, 
can be, if she's already struggling with other things in her life, now she pretty much has her two worlds. May, if, that can be an advantage, obviously, if it had been nothing, and then now she has a job. Um, but if that limits her ability to network with her community in any way, then that's, that can actually be a detriment and, and for, like, weaken her support system. Yep, exactly. Yep. We're going to close. I, I want to put a plug in for, because we talked about trauma for Seeking Safety, which is an evidence-based um, program for uh, uh, women in, in trauma that can be accessed through many of the community mental health agencies. And information. I'm sure you could um, contact your local community mental health agency and the health department and the Rocking Horse program, which works with um, pregnant and um, uh, mothers. Uh, who have addiction issues. So another great program that can be accessed through the Department of Health. And I really want to thank you all so much for coming and, and talking about this. And remind folks out there that um, we have our next meeting on poverty and behavioral economics uh, on November 20th at 12 o'clock. So please join us. Thanks and have a great day.